Hi everyone, it's James here from TSR Jivey Talks Tech. Now, one of the questions I get asked most often when I teach, as in sort of masterclasses, that sort of thing, or in questions and comments online, one of the questions I get the most is what is audio latency and how can I get rid of it? So in this video, I'm going to do my best to answer those questions. But now, it's time for this. So, latency, what is it? In short, latency is the delay between a signal or sound being generated and when it's heard or recorded. And this is often expressed in milliseconds or MS. Latency or audio delay occurs because our signal or sound passes through various analog and digital components. These days, these may include converters, drivers, and buffers and each of these introduce a very tiny delay. In our music recording world, it happens a bit like this. Input. The sound enters the microphone or other input device. Conversion. The sound is then converted from an analog signal into a digital signal via an A to D or analog to digital converter. This is normally inside our audio interface. Processing. The digital signal is then processed by the computer's drivers, digital signal processors, DSP, software, and buffers, which again, all add a little bit of delay. As you might expect, different processors or processes add a different amount of delay. Finally, we have the output stage, where our digital signal is converted back to an analog one via a D2A or digital to analog converter and sent to our speakers or headphones to be heard as sound. The total time for the entire input to output process is known as the system's round trip latency. In a modern recording studio, be that Abbey Road or your bedroom setup, where you're using a digital audio workstation, DAW, that could be Cubase, Logic, Pro Tools, Studio One, with some form of audio interface connected to your Mac or PC via USB, Thunderbolt, Firewire, HDX, there is going to be a level of latency that we have to deal with. Because if we don't, it's going to be at best tricky to get a project where we're not all recording instruments or parts at the same time to sound together and in time. Now, the reason I say that bit is because if we're recording an 80-piece orchestra in a multi-track way, giving each player or section their own microphone or microphones, and in turn their own recording channels, and you're capturing the performance all at the same time, the latency of the system is really not an issue, as you're not worrying about overdubs or adding parts later. Yes, the system latency might be an issue if you're providing headphones or cue mixes for the ensemble because the audio that you're recording is going through the conversion and processing on the way in and on the way out. But if you're just tracking live with no headphones or IMs, you do not need to worry about latency. It's only when it comes to adding signals and sound stuff later on that we really need to worry about it. During the overdubs or overdubbing process, this is when the latency thing jumps up to bite us. So latency is a thing and it's a beast we have to tame and tame it we shall. Now there are a number of things we can do in our recording system. And while some of these fixes are more effective than others, there is no one single magic fix or bullet that can make latency go away. So what can we do? There is a phrase that goes something on the lines of, you get what you pay for. And this has never been more true in the music technology world. Now, I'm not saying you have to rush out and upgrade your recording gear to the latest top of the range rack unit or multi-channel audio interface. But buying the gear from a well-known brand is going to be a good place to start. And there are two reasons for this. The first is obvious. Companies like Universal Audio, Focusrite, Presonus, Motu, RME have been making small, compact, and quality bomb-proof audio interfaces for years. All their kit sounds great, and 99% of the time, it's just gonna work for you straight out of the box. Sorry to the other brands that I know and love this time, but this is just a small subset of the names that I thought of. What I'm trying to say is, if you want to make great recordings, maybe buying the cheapest audio interface from a Chinese web store might not be the answer. The other reason to go for a well-known brand is the quality and stability of their drivers or driver software. Now, believe it or not, 
all hardware that you connect to your Mac or PC needs a little piece of software to allow it to talk to your host computer. This is known as the driver, for fairly obvious reasons. Most of the smaller and hence cheaper audio interfaces you buy are what's called class compliant, meaning that when you plug it into your computer, the hardware will automatically talk to the computer using the driver that's built into the computer's operating system. In the case of Mac OS, this is called the core audio driver. In short, if you're a Mac user like I am and your new interface supports core audio, you can normally just plug it in and your operating system and DAW software should be able to see the interface in its control panel. Often, the more complex the audio interface, the more whistles and bells it might have in the form of mic pre's or ins and outs, the more chance there will be that it will require a dedicated piece of driver software. This can nearly always be downloaded from the manufacturer's website, from the support pages. Keeping the driver up to date is one of the best ways to keep latency down. New, more efficient, and hence lower latency drivers are being written all the time. Sometimes to fix issues or bugs. Sometimes it's to add new features and functionality to the hardware. But sometimes it's just to make the recording experience faster and better for us, the user. So always make sure you have the latest drivers installed for your hardware. Remember, if there is an issue with a driver, you can always roll back to an older version. Okay, so we have an audio interface from a quality brand and our drivers are bang up to date. What can we do next? Something that perhaps I've taken for granted, but really should mention, is that your audio interface should be connected to your computer via an actual physical cable. As idyllic as it might be to have a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth audio interface, these formats are really not fast enough for high quality multi-track audio. So always use a decent quality USB, Thunderbolt, or appropriate cable to connect your interface to your PC or Mac or these days, your iPad or iPhone. At this point, it's over to our DAW. Now, my DAW of choice is Avid's Pro Tools for no other reason that it's the one I know, it works for me, and some might still call it the industry standard. But what I'm going to tell you are settings that are tweakable in all DAW applications. So far, we've talked about latency in terms of time in milliseconds. However, we're now going to start talking about latency in terms of samples, as the latency of our system is very dependent on the sample rate at which we set our DAW to record, and in turn, match the sample rate of the audio interface. Just a side note, most of the time, the hardware will follow the sample rate set by the DAW, but not always. Do make sure they match. So why change the format? Well, mainly because this is how most DAWs define how we set the latency by altering the buffer size in samples. But mainly I think it's because in recording terms, samples mean something that we can understand. If we set the sample rate of our session to 48 kilohertz or 48,000 samples per second, this means that every second is divided up into 48,000 little audio snapshots or samples, if you will. This is our recording resolution. If the buffer size in the DAW is set to 512 samples, the total latency of the system is one second divided by 48,000 multiplied by 512. And in this case, it's just over 106 milliseconds of round trip latency. Sadly, this would be a very noticeable amount of delay in the system. However, if we set the system to record at 96 kilohertz or 96,000 samples per second, still with a buffer size of 512 samples, we'd get a round trip latency of 53 milliseconds. Now this amount of latency is still something most musicians could hear or certainly feel, but it is better. But a buffer size of 512 samples is massive in terms of today's computing and computing power. If we record at 96K, with a buffer size of say 64 samples, we get a latency figure of around six milliseconds. It's claimed by some that you start to hear or feel latency around 20 milliseconds. So this would be a fantastic place to start our recording session. And it's in fact, one of the main reasons why I record all my sessions at 96 kilohertz. Now, it should be said that recording at 96K does put more load on your computer and will produce more recording data 
But these days, even a five or six year old computer has more than enough power to handle vast multi-track audio sessions. And drives and storage these days are as inexpensive as they've ever been, so there really is no excuse. There are other bonuses and benefits to working at higher sample rates, but that's for another video. I know, such a tease, right? So if we can lower the DAW buffer size down to 64 or 32 samples, why is this something we need to change? Well, it's all down to the load on your computer. While tracking, we want to keep the buffer size low to minimize the evil that is latency. However, running your session at a lower buffer size does put more load on your computer's resources like CPU power, RAM, and data transfer. As we mix, and the demand for those precious resources with things like plugins, plugin processing, we might choose to increase the buffer size to enable us to use more reverbs, delays, EQs, and dynamics processors, and not drive our recording system to the absolute limit all the time. The rule here is simple. Lowest possible buffer size when tracking, jack up the buffer when mixing. And if you ever need a good reason to get everything down before you start mixing and adding those thirsty plugins to your DAW session, this is it. Also remember that adding plugins to your session also increases the latency. While this might only be a very, very tiny amount, if you start piling on the effects, especially onto buses and master tracks, this can really impact your session latency. Some very heavy lifting mastering plugins put both a massive load on your computer and a boatload of delay latency into the session. If you need to go back and fix a part during the mix, remember to disable any bus or master channel plugins and drop that buffer size way back down to give yourself a fighting chance of having the overdub fix be in time with the rest of the session. In most cases, the artist or performer will tell you it's okay to hit record. Now there are a couple of other things we can do that will both reduce the latency and allow you to keep the audio buffer size small by reducing the load on your computer. Give your DAW software a fighting chance of running smoothly by closing down all other non-essential applications. If you're in the middle of a session, you do not need to check your email inbox. And if you're surfing while the session is running, just to let you know, Google Chrome is one of the biggest hogs of system resources that you have installed on your PC or Mac. You have been warned. You can also pause or stop a lot of the background processing that can again eat up precious system resources. There are different places to look on both PC or Mac, but a quick Google search for stop background processing PC or Mac will give you the solutions you require. Do remember not to stop your DAW or licensing software processes, but things like the Microsoft Assistant can probably be done without while you're in a high pressure tracking session. Some integrated hardware and software solutions, such as Universal Audio's Apollo interfaces with their Lunar DAW, or Avid Pro Tools with an Avid Carbon or a full HDX rig, offer what's called zero or low latency monitoring modes. Both the UA and Avid systems employ dedicated hardware-based DSP, which does not call on the resources of the computer to get a very effective low latency audio experience. I'm sure there are other hardware and software brands that do a similar thing, but these are the two that sprang to mind because they're the ones I've used. Again, a Google search is your friend for the specifics of your DAW and hardware, but these solutions do not take away from the fact that you should still follow the rules above before you start using zero or low level latency recording modes. Some hardware, like the Antelope Audio stuff that I use and the RME range of interfaces, have the ability to monitor through their own digital or software mixes and effects platforms. RME Total Mix and Antelope Audio's Synergy Core control panels allow you to configure dedicated monitoring paths for low latency monitoring using the DSP of the interface hardware. Again, I've not got time to go into this in this video into specifics, but I'm pretty sure you know where you can find the solution. At the other end of the audio spend spectrum, some small interfaces have a blend control on the hardware to allow you to mix between the input and output signals, meaning you can fade between your live mic or instrument and the track being played back. This was a feature of the original, the first generation Avid M boxes, and is a really quick way to get around monitoring through, or as we used to call it, monitoring back from tape. 
If you have the facility, you could always use an external mixer to route and manage your monitoring to again help reduce processing and in turn latency. It doesn't have to be a beautiful 24 channel monster like my Audion ASP8024, but taking the monitoring load away from the DAW and in turn the computer can be a great way to reduce the load on your computer and again in turn allow you to keep that buffer size down to 64 or even 32 samples. So there you go, some ideas on how you can reduce the audio latency in your recording system. Sorry, but in the world of digital audio, there is always going to be some form of delay in the system. But these techniques should allow you to get yourself set up so that the delay doesn't get in the way of your creativity. And when in doubt, always remember the golden rule. Small buffer when tracking, big buffer when mixing, and you won't go far wrong. So I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please do hit like, subscribe, and ring that bell to be kept up to speed with all things JTT. But for now, my name's James Ivey from TSR, Javi Talks Tech, and I'll see you again very soon.